Yeah, good morning, Patrice. Well, our calls to Marilyn Mosby's office have not been returned at this hour, but her husband, uh, Delegate Nick Mosby, has responded to us in a statement. I want to show you. It reads in part, quote, I have been in ongoing conversations with the IRS for five years about the tax consequences of an early withdrawal from my retirement savings plan, which I did to support unplanned expenses after a series of family tragedies. It goes on to say that I expect to have the issue resolved in the coming days. End quote. Now, all this comes as the IRS says state's attorney Marilyn Mosby and her husband, state delegate Nick Mosby, owe three years worth of taxes starting all the way back in 2014. Federal documents show that the IRS has now placed a lien on their property and is demanding that the couple pay up. A lien is a claim on property put in place to satisfy a debt. Giovanni Patterson, who is Nick Mosby's opponent in the upcoming city council president's race, calls the failure to pay taxes nothing short of incompetence. Marilyn and Nick Mosby are the 2020 Bonnie and Clyde, um, where, you know, instead of robbing trains, they're actually robbing from the people that they're supposed to serve. Now, a tax attorney who's not connected with this case that we spoke to says in most cases, the IRS gives property owners several opportunities to pay before placing a lien on their property. But once a lien is in place, they say it's rarely ever removed until it's paid in full. Well, we now know more about how Baltimore, Baltimore City Schools is spending its money. As Project Baltimore's Chris Papps explains, a lot of it isn't getting to the classroom. A complaint we often hear is that Baltimore City Schools is underfunded. So we took a look at where the money is going. Maryland has some of the nation's most funded large school systems, four of the top eight in per pupil spending, according to this 2020 U.S. Census report. But this report doesn't just show how much money is spent. We can also see where it's going. This is the kind of thing that parents need to get involved. Kathy Schlega is a state delegate representing Baltimore and Harford counties. She's also a former Baltimore City teacher. You know, parents want that money in the classroom. We know that's where you make the biggest difference in kids' lives. The census breaks down spending into categories for America's 100 largest school systems. And we discovered a chunk of city schools' money is not going to the classroom. It's it's not buying books, computers, or science equipment. Rather, it's going to administrators, principals, assistant principals, folks at North Avenue. Well, if higher administrative costs equaled better student outcomes, um, I think Baltimore City would have higher student achievement. According to the census, Baltimore City has the third highest administrative costs in the country behind Boston and Denver. Maryland has six schools in the top 17. To put all of this into perspective, Project Baltimore looked at two other urban school districts that are about the same size as Baltimore, Austin, Texas, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. All three have about 80,000 students. But Austin spends $785 per student on administrative costs. Albuquerque spends 673, about half of what Baltimore spends. City schools administrators declined an interview with Fox 45 News to discuss administrative costs, but we did receive a statement saying the numbers are accurate but misleading because of how the census collects data. The statement said, due to the school budgeting approach we use, many administrative costs for city schools are actually student and school costs that we pay for centrally. The statement explained Baltimore City would rank much lower when only comparing central office spending and removing school level administrative costs such as principals. To see us really number three for administration is disappointing. How are we spending that money? Are kids learning? Are we getting money into the classroom? In 2019, the federal government released data on school performance known as the nation's report card. While the census ranks Baltimore City third highest for administrative costs, the nation's report card ranked Baltimore the third lowest performing in math and reading, only ahead of Cleveland and Detroit. Education is important. Maryland citizens always value education as one of their top five priorities. But at some point, you have to ask yourself, what's the return on investment? Do you have a concern about where your school is spending money? 
Call our hotline, send me an email, go to foxbaltimore.com to follow our progress. Could this be the most dangerous intersection in Baltimore City? Well, this one area has seen dozens of crashes in the last two years. Just a few of them on your screen right now. Fox 45 has been closely following this intersection at Kenwood Avenue and Monument Street since two children were hit on a sidewalk. Officials have promised action, but neighbors say little has changed. Fox 45's Real Creighton is live at the scene with the latest on a story that you are seeing tonight first on Fox. Real. Hey, Kai and Mary, the problem remains. DOT, as promised, did initiate a traffic study, but neighbors who were once relieved and hopeful that something would change now back to feeling frustrated and angry. They say those crashes continue. had another accident right there. It's been nearly two months since Fox 45 last spoke with Tonetta Collins, how people drive around here. Right there in the race. That was then. This is now. Nothing changed. Kenwood Avenue and Monument Street. What could be the highest crash intersection in all of Baltimore, according to DOT. Just this month, three crashes, three weeks. Neighbors document the latest, a car upside down, another taken out, what they call the usual. Over the past two years, Fox 45 found 73 911 calls for accidents here, over 30 crashes, buildings on every corner. This was a sound structure, four accidents ago. Hit multiple times. See that? Including where Brian Green lives, outside his house. Right up and down this road. Well, it's hard to get through an interview. Well, I'm concerned, people. You don't feel comfortable letting your kids play out here. In August, a car did jump the curb, plowing into a 10-year-old girl and a 5-year-old boy. They survived. After Fox 45's investigation into this road, DOT committed to a traffic study. This, the new speed camera installed. It is in Councilwoman Shannon Sneed's district. We reached out three times to ask what she's doing about it. We didn't hear back. A Republican, Kim Klasik, running to be this community's representative in Maryland 7th, did have a response, calling it a local issue, but saying she'd be willing to step in. But I would love to raise my voice in support uh, to make sure it gets done. Now, we also did reach out to DOT tonight and did not hear back, but they have told us in the past that that traffic study would go on for three to four weeks after it was done. Then they say they will decide the best course of action. Meantime, Councilwoman Shannon Steen's office also told us two months ago that she was working hard on behalf of her residents in District 13. She said she had a no parking sign put in that would help spare the cars from being constantly hit in that area. Here's the stop snitching culture has thrived on the streets of Baltimore, leaving crimes unsolved and killers on the streets. But police are now crediting a number of recent arrests on tips from the public. So is that culture finally changing? Fox 45's Dan Lamparella live with si some experts say a lot more work needs to be done. Dan. Well, Mary, after a crime, officers are often faced with a steel wall of silence when trying to seek information about that crime, frustrating not only them, but the families of victims. And while, as you said, some tips are beginning to lead to arrests, changing that fear culture here with trying to bring out information is going to take a lot longer. It was a crime that shook the city. An MTA bus driver shot and killed while on the job last week. But only hours later, police had their suspects, thanks in part to tips from the public. My message to the community is, we cleared this case with your help. We need your help with other cases. BPD has highlighted the public's help in a number of recent cases after years of struggling to get witnesses to come forward. This is exactly how we reduce murder in Baltimore and how we hold people accountable when they commit these heinous acts. But despite this recent success, a no snitch culture remains deep rooted in our city in crisis. It just makes no sense that we're going on two years now and there have not been any arrests. Annette Dix is still waiting for someone to come forward in the killing of her son, Kayvon. I've gone through that area, I don't know how many times, and I'm just confused as to how nobody saw anything. And while she's encouraged to hear more tips are coming in, she believes fear of retaliation is keeping many more quiet. 
I would love to have my son back, but I wouldn't want another person to lose their life because they did come forward and say, hey, I saw what happened to your son. Trading silence for safety, something experts say shows police have a long way to go. I think if you're going to get rid of that culture of stop snitching, it's got to start with developing trust. Tonight over the mayor's plan to outsource water meter billing. If that happens, it will leave dozens of DPW workers without jobs. And now there's question over if the move is even legal. Fox 45's Dan Lamparello live with the decision and the pushback from some of those workers. Dan? While Kai and Mary, water billing issues have plagued the city of Baltimore for years. And while some of those workers who are being laid off say it's not their fault, there are some who say the privatization of this struggling organization could help it start freely flowing again. The water has been running in Baltimore, but the meters meant to read it have been far from accurate. These issues have been around since the new systems went into place uh, four years ago. Four years of wrong bills and uncollected revenue. The city blames on human error. The issues just have not gone away. The issues are, have remained, and it's become so significant that we had to make a change. That change came last week when Mayor Jack Young announced the city would be outsourcing meter reading, installation, and maintenance to the private contractor, ITRON, laying off 63 DPW workers. Why are we consistently balancing the budgets and, and righting the wrongs of the city administration on the backs of the employees who do the grunt work, do the job every day? The City Union of Baltimore calling the move short-sighted and blamed the billing issues on faulty equipment. The city wants to make it seem as if these employees are in competent. These are not incompetent people. You the union has even gotten the backing of City Council President Brandon Scott, who's now looking into if the move by the mayor was even legal. But privatizing a broken system like this isn't unprecedented. It makes sense at this point to privatize, try something different. It's a move economist Aniban Basu believes is in the best interest of the city. If a city determines that Something that it's doing is not being done well, and it would be very expensive to revamp that system. The logical thing to do is to outsource it to somebody who can't do it well. Now, according to the mayor's office, this move could save the city upwards of $50 million. But in the meantime, the city's law department is currently investigating on behalf of Brandon Scott's office to see if this could violate any antitrust uh, acts within the charter amendments of the city. That's something, though, the mayor has denied.